Good times, all you beautiful individuals. Welcome back to another epi of League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you fine folks to wrap up our individual player rankings for the World Championship. Still got the bot laners, 80 carry, and support to get through. And of course, the Asian Games. It's not exhibition matches anymore. It has officially kicked off the League of Legends side of things. So a combination of Worlds preview and games, even though we don't have highlights from, we got stats. It's not going to hit the same, obviously, as a regular highlights or a recap type of situation, but it's the best we got right now at this time in this incredible one, almost pretty much two months between playoff games and Worlds. We get a little bit of sprinkling of action in the Asian games and, of course, continuing that preview coverage of this Worlds event. And we're stopping into that bottom lane, covering in those ADCs and those supports. 10 to 1, and you know... We got to start because they're usually at the bottom of these lists. A little Western Persuasion Berserker. If you looked at Spring, if you were looking at MSI or even last year heading into Worlds, I feel like you were feeling an all-time high level with him. Right now, it's kind of a bit of a dip. His performance in playoffs, Cloud9's performance as a whole. So you're definitely feeling a little bit better about Han Sama in terms of top Western ADC heading into the event. Yes, uh, and as far as Berserker goes, I think even the most big-time Berserker fans would acknowledge that this year has kind of either been a status quo or maybe a little bit of a step back. How much of that you you know equate to the Cloud9 situation and the rest of the roster's performance, that's a different discussion. But I think when you are looking at, at his numbers, everything is there. Everything's more or less in line. Some good win percentages on the Aphelios, on that Kai'Sa that was strong, the one that stands out that's a little weird is the 50% win rate on that Zaya of champions. Still played quite a lot type of thing like that. And, and someone that we know that can't take advantage of it didn't work out this year. It's kind of a little odd thing in those numbers. But what did work out this year is the return back to Europe for Han Sama, really capitalizing, really rejuvenating and returning to that form that built up the established title that he had as one of the most lethal bot lane options in the Western scene. And right now, the most lethal option the Western scene has got in the bottom lane. And maybe the most interesting champ pool in terms of 80 carries at this entire event. Yes, yes, sir. Throw me in those Dravens that we know and love from Mr. Han Sama. But we even got to see a couple of other things come through uh, that were a little bit unexpected, I think, this year. We got to see some of that Kogma action going on through there. And, of course, the return of the Callista to Mr. Han Sama and the way that that was able to dominate when it's been brought out. Those are two champions that I'm keeping my eye on with him in that bottom lane. And they've been banned against him. We've seen him pull up the Samira to a high level as well. He's definitely got a champion ocean in that bot lane. Then we get to, of course, a lot of these Eastern 80 carries, both light and deft. I feel like fill a similar role in their current squads where they got some balls to the walls, crazy players like the shy showmaker Canyon on these rosters and deft and light are the guys sitting in the back line going, guys, just chill. I got this. I'll be I'll be the calm and stoic one that's not losing his mind. They're the guy that is untouchable when everything else is popping off for the team because he is being well supported. He's got these other threats that you're trying to deal with. His damage can always pump out and come across from through light and death. Yes, very steady, consistent type of guys. I think when you're talking about Deft, I think there's obviously a higher ceiling for something like that compared to, to Light, and just that's all over the course of this long veteran career from Deft that we have seen that established. Returning again, a second time around, Last Dance, part two. How can it go for Mr. Deft this time around? It's the last, last dance, you know. Oh, okay, I see how Before the trilogy, out. the final last, last dance, which will happen uh, next year for him. But yeah, obviously excited to see him defend that world's title and play on this ramping up D plus lineup, uh, a pair of fourth seeds in Weibo and D plus aiming and then followed by Guma. I feel like aiming is a guy who we were feeling so incredibly high about much like the KT rollster squad as a whole heading into playoffs. And then the back-to-back -back losses to T1 kind of really peeled us back, especially because Guma played so well individually in that series is why he's, Bumped him out of that top five spot. 
Yeah, and I think that this is another one of those situations where aiming has done so much right throughout the whole course of the summer split until you get to those finals. And then we are looking at those final matches for him against T1 and against what Guma was able to bring to the table. And I think kind of even with some of those, you know, games going the side of KT in that series and that back and forth, I think it was pretty decidedly so in the favor of T1, in the favor of Guma, in that 1v1, 2v2, anything that was in that bottom lane was able to take control of it. That's why we throw Guma up there. And I think for someone like Guma, you know, it's even a conservative position for him, given his potential, given that talent. We know that is there. This is like seeing, you know, uh, Michael Schumacher or something, just a couple laps behind you, knowing that he's going to be picking up pace. He's going to be picking it up. Mr. Guma, a couple games to warm up for this world's event. He's going to be in top shape. And especially when the guy ahead of him in Elk, you could maybe argue BLG, maybe pop the tire on one of these turns uh, in that playoff push for them. Elk uh, individually, not not too much to blame for the fizzling out that BLG had in playoffs. And obviously we still saw that absolute world-class level out of him throughout uh, all the lead up to playoffs. But unfortunately for him, Gal is the guy who turned to another gear in playoffs, and that's why he's sitting ahead of him. Oh, man. That is the story, isn't it? Uh, everything that had gone on throughout the whole year in the LPL, and especially the, the run at MSI. Yeah, we're cheering all the way for Elk and what he has done and how he has boomed this year, hitting that big-time potential that we knew that he could bring. But you're right. There is another evolution. There is that step up from him and that is what gala brought to the table for his team and this was one that took a couple of weeks to get going you know two maybe three weeks and then we started to really pick up you started to see that type of all-star form that someone like gala brings to the table that proven winner domestically and someone that is proven to be a threat on the international stage as well welcome back to world's gala welcome back the kaisa pentakill god but still not enough to crack that top two because as we highlighted on the top 20 players list, for me, this might be the most hype individual matchup at the entire event. It's Pays versus Ruler. I know we got a tease sort of of it at MSI, but here at Worlds with both of them playing at pretty easily. Number one, number two, AD Carry coming into this. This is must-see TV, man. Oh, yes, sir. I can't believe that we get to talk about these two that uh, you told me at the beginning of the year that it was going to play out like this. You would never believe it because how could someone step up to the level that Ruler has been performing at what he delivered for Gen G over the course of his career and time there? Pace has stepped in and said, this is how it's done. Let me show you how it's done. You bet on yourself. You have that aggression. You have the skills. The thing for me is one of the things in the last couple of weeks of the season that we saw from him end in playoffs is that bet on yourself mentality that this guy says I, just because i'm a rookie just because i'm young here doesn't mean that i can't pull my weight i can't contribute to the level of my skills for this gen g team give me the champions give me that trust and he paid it back to his teammates and the rest of the squad with his performances hey stepping in as number two but you gotta give that respect still over to rule the king himself our top player to really watch in from last year's event continued his form all the way through dominating in the LPL dominating in the international exposure rulers back baby and he's looking for the title with JDG and that's why this matchup is so great I think both guys want to prove that they're better than the other in that head-to-head -head matchup obviously pays being the replacement to ruler and ruler saying that's great you guys are winning but we're going for the golden road this year we are at another level so best matchup at the whole event for me support side of things who are always there making the 80 carries look good and not getting any of the credit but number 10 on this list Trimby has absolutely gotten plenty of credit for the turnaround that was Fnatic and his individual performance I feel like goes hand in hand with how good Fnatic is looking because when he's had some off games Fnatic as a whole looks real off oh hell yes we get to talk about Trimby this is the one where <laughs> my bias is gonna show i wanted to get my boy out here on the list especially with the job that he did and what type of role he played in the turnaround for this fanatic organization that we saw in summer the return to that top level of play in the lec trimby a big part of that on the rift 
and off the rift with that type of personality. And that's why I'm only bringing it up again. Love to talk about Trimby, love to bring up all these things. But this is important at these type of international events and especially with a new format to keep that mentality, keep that positivity flowing. Hey, nobody better for that than Trimby down in the bot lane for Fnatic. And ahead of him, you know, we have Kellen, who's obviously played the bulk of the games. We might be seeing Bible, maybe, in some of these games. I'm, I'm assuming that's going to be the sub that's coming over uh, for D+. Both have had some standout moments, and Kellen, you know, definitely, I think just putting the pressure on him to, hey, that starting spot isn't yours guaranteed, I think really pushed him to another level to close out summer. If we see a Moomoo support become the number one pick in the meta, dial up Bible, put him in. That's my guy for those type of engages. Otherwise, I, I think it should be the Kellen show for D plus Kia, especially because I think in the last little bits that we saw of him, he kind of solidified that spot alongside Def, that this is the pairing that you should be working around, continuing to build synergy and chemistry. And I know how the heck are you going to do that in the last couple of weeks? You got to try for anything here at this point in the year to stabilize for D plus Kia. And I think what you could see in that bot lane duo between these two, and if they continue to get that level of familiarity between each other, that's an advantage for D plus Kia. And then you get to some veteran versus rookie, obviously. Crisp, the world champion, but Hong, I think, was one of the more hyped up young support players going back to even like rare Adam times. And I think he is obviously... You know, being paired with a veteran guy like Gala has really helped him. But you've definitely seen the growth and development of a young player here that you are genuinely excited about this LNG bot lane. And it's not just because of Gala. I love this because Hong is going to be the player. He's going to be the picks that you tell if the other team has done the full list of homework for. Because if you're skipping out on scouting him and scouting that champion pool and finding what is the best options for him to take out of the pool, you ain't doing your job right because he is a threat down there if he is getting an option getting his hands on that nautilus on the leona 100 percent win rate in summer on that leona be careful because this guy he's going to be going into your team and you better believe that even if he's popped the rest of that squad getting that damage and gala's picking up those kills you like to see that someone else very familiar with the leona <laughs> is the highest ranking western player on any of these lists if we had to rank western players he would be the number one guy coming into this event. It is the MVP, not just for summer, for the whole year in the LEC. Mickey or Mickey X, whichever you prefer. This guy was an absolute treat to watch. And it's amazing that a year ago we were talking about this guy potentially being washed up on Excel. Now look at him. Oh, thank goodness we get him back with the G2 Samurai. And yes, we have that fire reignited in his career because... It was a sad time because this is one of, if not what, the most decorated support down in that bottom lane in, in for Europe, really picking things up with this G2 dynasty over the course of his career, returning back there and returning to form and returning to this type of list uh, before the world's event. Really happy to see Mickey here. One of the best things that you saw about him throughout this summer split, that Braum support, I think really out of this whole list, Definitely the most lethal, most proficient Braum that we we saw throughout this summer split. One of those options. And then you can even go to something new, the Milio. I think that he was really strong on that Milio pick. I believe a perfect uh, win rate as well. I mean, kind of easy to do with G2, the way that they were controlling things. But still, you're looking at those champions. You're looking at that playmaking that he brings to the table. And even more so, that synergy alongside Han Solo. We talk about things all the time and where it lifts up the ADC and, and all these other type of things. I think in this relationship, it actually is lifting up Mickey a little bit more because he gets to get more of these pop-ups. He unlocks him a little bit more, and then he gets to go around the map. And that's a dangerous time when you lose track of where Mickey is on the rip. He's always been one of the quickest adapters to changes in the meta, which as we know, is an incredibly important aspect of a world championship run once the tournament itself starts kind of developing its own meta. So I wouldn't be shocked if he's having some of the biggest impact on what champions are becoming OP, OP in this kind of micro bubble of world's meta. And you better believe that there's going to be that micro uh, bubble meta deforming at this world's it always happens type of thing. Yes, there are the meta picks to watch heading into the event, but every now and then, you get that pick. Oh, that one's really strong. 
and then somebody has figured out through their scrims. That's the secret to take it down. This is that counter. This is whatever. Picks and bands start shifting around. Those type of things. Absolutely. The chaos is where G2 and Mickey are going to thrive. And we've talked about Kyria uh, when we did the top 20 players that he's not in his best form, but is absolutely on an upward curve. I feel like all this experience at the Asian Games is only going to help him out more. So wouldn't be shocked if by the end of the tournament, we're talking him in the category as best support at the event. I like that you bring up uh, that he's going to get a little boost here from these Asian games. And I think that, I mean, obviously you can't totally guarantee that type of thing, but looking at what he's going to be doing. Confidence is the big thing for him. Confidence is absolute, again, a very emotional player. Confidence is going to be important for someone like Kyria, but as well, uh, just the interaction, the exposure with these other players, these other levels of skill, these other approaches to the game from the coaching staff, from the players that are going to be there for Kyria, absolutely a big benefit for him heading and a little boost before this type of event to Worlds. Yes, a player that we think should be rated higher up on this list, but we can't uh, justify it compared to the performances of these others this year. Especially when you go head to head, and let's be honest, kind of both series against Gen G, Delight was having more impact in lane and around the map. Which is scary, scary to think that le that he's leveled up to that type of degree right now, Mr. Delight, and what he's able to bring for Gen G. A lot of people thought that he could have this type of effect, but I don't think anybody was betting on it to be to this type of level again one of these guys that has just really really meshed with his bot lane partner in pays that helps that you know kind of uh, that you know without thinking ability that they've got to communicate in the bottom lane and get things going in sync really love to see it happy to have delight up here in the list and again pays has looked fantastic but respect for respect is due for how delight has helped guide this rookie to this all-time level of performance throughout all of 2023 the buildup for these Asian games, I feel like we've been talking about it for a full year because it was delayed. This is still technically the 2022 Asian games. And then when games finally start get going, this, this whole tournament is less than a week, Mark. We already got two games behind us and Group A's decided, shocker, it was 2-0 for South Korea. Who'd have thunk it? Uda Thunken, and you know, this is strange. I can't remember the name of this mid laner rolling on through. He kind of reminds me of this faker guy, right? Yeah, That's not really what similar. the name tag says, but yeah, no, plays like him. no, absolutely plays like him. He's got the moves like faker out there in the mid lane because it is faker secret between you and me. He was dominating out there, the Yone picking up those kills. Uh, it was fantastic from Korea, but obviously expected that they would dominate and crush to this type of form. I think. The more interesting thing to actually really talk about here with given these games is what it shows us in the format that was chosen for this event and how it is set it up. Absolutely some uh, one that's going to need some tinkering. Yeah, the, the one thing I feel like you needed to do for this event in terms of the bracket, the only thing that matters is you have Team China and South Korea on opposite ends of the bracket. So you're getting them in the finals. That's not how things are going to play out. China's skipping the group stage altogether, which again... At two games at like 40 minutes that Korea was winning didn't really matter. But they're on the same side. So they're matching up in the semifinals. Korea's playing Kazakhstan again now in the quarters, which of course they're going to be massive favorites. So Korea and China meeting up in the semifinals feels like a bit of a buzzkill as that's really the gold medal match. It is a buzzkill. It, it still doesn't take away that the expectation is that we're going to get a jam-packed, fantastic uh, little series between these two matching up for the semifinals. But it takes that wind out of the sails for that gold medal match, which, I mean, barring anything absolutely bonkers and crazy, is going to be the winner of that semifinal match moving on through and taking down that gold medal match in, in you know, half the time it took to finish out that semifinal match. Yes, the one thing you had to do, have them on opposite sides, didn't get that through. And as well, I mean, even the coverage of this is not so great. I think you can find it uh, a couple streams on Afrika. And I know that there's been, you know, Vietnamese uh, VODs of, of some of these games put up on YouTube type of thing. A little bit more organization would have been nice. And, you know, that's, I, I feel like when we were, I mean, Asian Games now, 2018 was a long time ago. It was similar. It was difficult to find uh, some of the stuff. Now, obviously, on the other side of the bracket, the other you know, solid teams that have a lot of pro players. It's Chinese Taipei and Vietnam, who 
one of them is getting a silver medal, most likely going to be going through there. And then the loser will probably play China in the bronze medal match. So a great opportunity for both of those countries to represent in this tournament. Yeah, and again, as much as it is, you know, this still overwhelming favorite for Korea, for China to get, you know, get on through and be in that finals matchup and take it all the way through for the gold medal, you do need to remember as you lace it up, those two teams, they have the absolutely the capability of pulling off an upset. If all things fall into their favor, all these type of things, we've seen wackier upsets, bigger upsets on the international stage at world's type of events. Why not here at the Asian Games? And, you know, we've seen teams kind of all build up for a marquee matchup, kind of lay everything on the line in semifinals, and then not forget or disrespect, but not be at the same level of preparedness for the finals, which, I mean, something with as high a stakes as this and how seriously the players and coaching staff take these events, unlikely for either Korea or China, but not impossible. We're trying to find any type of angle here to keep that gold medal match having some type of weight to it, some type of, uh, you know, con- con- you know, being contested right between these two squads, even with whoever it is, South Korea or China, being a massive, overwhelming favorite. It's it just really is what the way that this event has gone through. It's a little disappointing. Again, the the lack, you know, of easy access coverage for the whole international community, more so just in a sense of, you know, where we were in 2018 to where it is now. You had maybe even last year where it was supposed to go. Couldn't figure it out. All these type of things. But at the end of the day, these players are getting this opportunity, which is fantastic to represent their countries, something that we are looking to see more in League of Legends, more type of opportunities in international events. And as well, we talked about in the top 10 list, getting that type of little bit of extra preparation before Worlds, always a nice treat. And again, the thing we forget often talk about uh, with this whole event is esports even being included at all at these Asian games. I know, obviously, esports as a viable career path in entertainment is much more popular in these Asian countries than in places like North America. But it's still a huge step forward for the entire scene to be included in such a marquee event as the Asian Games. Obviously, Olympics a long ways away before we're getting some League of Legends or Valorant on that kind of a stage. But who knows? Maybe a few Olympics from now. But that is it today for League Unlocked. Erica Mark here with you. Beautiful people. Thanks for watching. As always, we will catch you on that flippity flip.